around the mid 80s there was a serious problem on Canadian ski hills. So serious that it made the CBC News. It was called snow surfing and this antisocial behavior was being committed on ski boards or snowboards. Maybe it was also called snowboarding. Not Maybe not quite yet. And this was a threat to the polite society that skiers had peaceably cultivated on the slopes for generations before this. Quite a lot of them are uncooperative. Um, some of them have had a little bit to drink. Smart Alex, you go up and approach them in a very calm, collect manner and they, they tend to lip you off. You ask them very nicely to leave, that they're endangering the public and possibly themselves, and they, uh, they swear at you. These uncooperative smart Alex who had had a bit to drink were introducing a new piece of technology to the social arena of downhill fun. People like this menace to society. I don't know, they just don't like how it looks. They think it's dangerous. They don't want no new equipment or anything probably up there. Now, up until that point, at least, the skiers had been successful in upholding the sanctity of the chairlists. No snowboarders were allowed on those. But, unfortunately, there was no way to stop those snow surfers from climbing the hills on foot and then endangering themselves and the public by sliding back down that hill on one wide board instead of two narrow boards and probably being impolite in the process. The, the audacity. And they'll go right in between the skiers and we'll kick them off and they'll just lip us off. Say, if one of these... Uh, skateboards or ski boards, whatever they're called, hit a person, they'd break their leg. They're just like a missile. And most of them have no brakes on them. Even if snowboarding is just another California fad, the people who work on local ski hills say one season is one too many. And there was no compromise in sight, no hope for the future. Do you see any compromise in the future at all? No. If these boards become more and more popular, it's going to be more hassles. Um, more confrontation. We just like to say that we don't want them at all. I don't really have much at stake in this. In fact, nothing. I've still never been downhill skiing and I've only been snowboarding three times. So if I had to choose a side, it would be team snow surf, but it's not really something I have a large stake in. But the reason I'm bringing this up is it's a case study in the social construction of technology. An approach to science and technology studies that perhaps not coincidentally goes back to around the same period as that snow surfing video. I mean, I'm joking. It is a coincidence. It has nothing directly to do with snowboards. Whether or not we should study science and technology using the same analytical lens instead of seeing them as two separate things. It's almost like a rhetorical question now as I say this in 2021, but in the mid-80s it was an earnest question as to whether we should study science and technology using the same analytical lens, and the approach began as an argument in favor of, of doing that. The SCOT approach began with identifying relevant social groups with regards to a certain technology, both producers and users of that technology. That specific technology is called an artifact, which has different meanings for different groups, and they focus on the problems and the solutions that each group sees in that artifact or around that artifact. And for that reason, artifacts have what they call interpretive flexibility that's revealed through the meanings that those groups attach to it. Social groups interact in the context of a technological frame through which they arrive at shared meanings. In the process, the artifact is gradually constructed and deconstructed through social interaction. As time goes on, when a design for the artifact is widely accepted by different social groups, it's likely to get stabilized and closed, which means the problem disappears. Not that the problem is actually solved, but I guess it looks that way to enough people. It's similar to the idea of black boxing that others have described and that I've talked about in previous videos. And all of this is about studying the culture of science and technology together, not just studying science in society. So what we just saw was a snapshot from the history of snowboards getting closed. Apparently the thing that came before the snowboard was the snurfer which wasn't actually tied to your feet. It just had like a grip surface that you stood on and that was hopefully good enough to get to the bottom of the hill together with, with the snurfer. So maybe that's why those morally upright uh, skiers in the CBC video in 1985 feared there was no binding on the snowboards. And most of them have no brakes on them. By then there would have been, but I guess fair enough there wasn't shortly before that. Arguably that video comes from around the time that the snowboard was stabilized or closed. There's of course been innovations and improvements since then, but I think the boards mostly look and work pretty much the same as they did in 85. But the meaning has changed quite a bit. Contrary to predictions made in 1985, I think that skiers and snowboarders have kind of achieved some level of truce, or things have certainly improved since that video 36 years ago. Or at least that's what I found based on the three times that I went to Banff over the past decade and from kind of informal conversations with members of each group. In fact, there's some uh, double agents who take part in both sports 
And on that note, snowboarding is a sport now. It's been a sport officially for quite a while. It's been in the Olympics since 1998. But all along the way between what you saw in that video from 85 and snowboarding being recognized as a legitimate sport as time went on, Throughout that transition, the board and snowboarding were recreated and reconstituted over time through this complex, symbiotic set of interactions between the technology, the social groups around it and involved in it, and everything else about the broader context. And the process continues. I think e-bikes are still quite a while away from this endpoint of stabilization. There's, there's still court cases around where the e-bike definition stops and where moped starts and thus what needs to be licensed, who riders are accountable to, and how. So there's the hoverboards, as they're sometimes called, that have been the subject of some funny memes in recent years. There's those Segway slash unicycle things that I keep seeing more and more of. Technologies that seem to have been stabilized quite a while ago being reopened and re-questioned and kind of bleeding into each other. One critique of the SCOT approach is that it focuses too much on the so-called heroic design and invention stages. And so the groups involved at that stage are privileged both in the approach to research they're privileged and also in real life they're privileged. Those working in feminist science and technology studies, for example, have noted in particular that women have historically been excluded from that heroic design and invention stage. Others say the nature of closure is too rigid because technology continues to, to develop as it's being used and well after it's apparently been closed, as these past couple of examples I think have shown. The idea of closure addresses the meanings that social groups make of the artifact and stabilization refers to how the artifact is developed with a relevant social group. Closure is consensus, according to Pinch and Biker, and it can happen two ways. There is rhetorical closure when the relevant social groups think the problem is solved, whether or not it actually is, and, you know, who gets to decide whether it actually is, or is it ever. The other way is by defining the problem, and both types are largely the jobs of marketing departments. And once those things are closed, it's hard to look back, or maybe there's no point in looking back, like, like air tires on a bike. Nobody was nostalgic for solid wheels, or reconsidering the possibilities of those once the air tires became closed. Although there is a reasonably popular local beer that's named after the old bikes that had those solid wheels, but that's because it just looks so ancient and quaint, because no living person can remember what it was like to ride one of those bikes. But still, in some newer work along these lines, uh, Lee Humphreys, for example, prefers the idea of temporary closure as a kind of update to all of this, because like any kind of rhetoric, closure is never actually done for good. And much the same can be said of stabilization. Other scholars and critics say the, the original idea of stabilization was too simple, especially in a post-Fordist marketplace where everything is fragmented. Another interesting modification is Rosh's idea that people process objects at three levels. There is the superordinate level, for example, the vehicle, the basic level, for example, the car, and the subordinate level, for example, the sports car. And they go in that order from most to least abstract. When changes occur at the basic level, so in this example at the level of the car, new subordinate categories come into being. Or if we go back to a previous example, bicycles were stabilized at some point, but they led to things like the mountain bike. And the hope is by analytically separating the basic and the subordinate levels of structural flexibility, we can look closer at how to technology is actually developed. Michael Koo, for example, takes a strong stand, I think, against the idea of closure, period. In my reading, the argument is that it's become fetishized, like a fact, or maybe even an artifact in and of itself, rather than as an analytical concept for studying the formation of that artifact. The bicycle and its offshoots, that example from before, is also an example of this, or another, which is kind of funny to read in 2021, reading a journal article from 2005, is the telephone with a digital camera and an MP3 player kind of all rolled into one. So at some point, phones were stabilized, but then there were cell phones, and then there were cell phones that also have a camera in them and an MP3 player in them. What will they think of next? Ku's critique rests on his problems with two core assumptions of SCOT, that artifacts move towards closure and stabilization, and that there's a, a winner-take-all competition among the social groups for framing that technology. So instead, Ku prefers theories that model practice and context as mutually and iteratively generative over time, like Bordeaux's habitus or Geertz's approach to culture as, as a model of and a model for social practice. Even viewing structure and artifact as a dialectic is that that's too reductive for, for Ku. Instead, he argues for an emergent approach, or as he puts it, the artifact never achieves closure but is constantly emergent. And then we have Humphrey's reframing social groups, closure and stabilization in the social construction of technology, which is a self-proclaimed complication of Finch and Biker's original SCOT aimed at, quote, gaining insight into long-term processes of how we use and understand technology. And some of the critiques made in this piece 
statistics include that SCOT ignores the rules of political economy and ideology in technological innovation. The idea that defining relevant social groups is arbitrary or even relativistic, which, quote, ignores the moral and political values with which people judge technology. For example, a relevant social group is seen as people who share the same set of meanings attached to an artifact. So in the bicycle example, women and elderly men were seen as, as one group, and young men who race bikes were seen as another group. So in Humphrey's view, this focuses too much on the objectives of the social groups with regards to that artifact, and not enough on the resources because not all groups have the same power and influence over technology. So instead she proposes four general categories of social groups, as she puts it, as a way to account for this. Producers, advocates, users, and bystanders. Producers, of course, have a vested economic interest in proliferating the artifact and getting it out there, which I guess is obvious because they make it and they sell it. Advocates, quote, operate within an organized community with regards to how to use that artifact and what's interesting about it. And Humphreys gives a sort of odd range of examples Examples here, but maybe that's the point. Maybe that's to demonstrate that the concept is malleable. From academia and the medical community in general, for example, to Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the NRA. Pretty broad spectrum of groups. So advocates played a key role in shaping restrictions around cell phone use, for example, which led to the popularity of earpieces. As for users, as Humphreys puts it, they, quote, socially construct technology through their use or potential use of the technology, and they influence others around them in doing so. As for bystanders, there's some overlap between them and advocates, but they're usually, quote, atomized individuals whose opinions and language shape the social construction of technology. Bit of a minor point, but I don't really buy this uh, atomized individual part. I don't believe anybody's an atomized individual. But still, their individual values and judgments help shape the, the zeitgeist surrounding a certain technology. The example given is the kind of long-range development of cell phone etiquette and social etiquette around silent mode. Now, obviously, COVID has since added a new layer of, of fun and complication to all of this. But if you think back to the era just before COVID, so you know, the late 2010s, if we can now say that. Um, you didn't hear cell phones going off in classrooms very much. Maybe the occasional ding from a text, but you, you'd almost never hear somebody's phone ringing in, with a ringtone in class. And it's because of these changing interactions and uses of technology over the long run among these four different social groups, if, if you want to use Humphrey's terms. It's funny because the article was published in 2005 when cell phones used to go off in classrooms all the time. I was a, a, a TA back then, a teaching assistant, a.k.a. Uh, uh, tutorial leader and uh yeah it was the ringtone era so it was cool at the time to have a very ostentatious ringtone usually it was just a popular song that would play when your phone rang so i would say somebody's phone would go off maybe once or twice in an average hour of class so that's once or twice that the class would be interrupted by ludicrous or chameleon air i think arguably it was the bystanders who put a stop to that one for the most part the the more senior professors who maybe weren't big fans of chameleon air or ludicrous or ringtones or cell phones or technology. So what's the point of all this? Ideally the point is to change it. So Biker outlined some future directions in one of his older papers and said there's three possible paths. There's academic study, there's policy study, and political and societal engagement. Stern and Leach, for example, want us to take that a step further moving beyond the academy to engage with social movements, which they say would entail giving up on, quote, some of the cherished political disengagement that characterizes the method of social constructivism. But that's a whole new topic that needs a video of its own, really, so I'm going to stop here. That was just my summary of some aspects of the social construction and technology approach and uh, a couple of examples that I hope brought it to life a little bit. Thanks for watching. I'll be back soon with some more studying information and knowledge practices.